So we're talking today about population, specifically distribution and abundance. Now there's a lot of other things that we could talk about with populations, but we're going to just start with distribution and abundance. So just for review, a population is a group of individuals of a single species in a specific area, usually some sort of landscape. So it can include a pride of lions in a specific area of the Serengeti, or it could include multiple prides of lions that live within a river um, within a, a, an area. So again, defined to um, a group of the same species within a specified area. And when talking about population, we can talk about total number of individuals, or we can also talk about uh, density. <clears throat> Other things are going to include age distribution, so the different classes of ages within the population, growth rates, distribution, and abundance. So some of the things that have been in the news recently which apply to this include this picture of Cecil the lion who was killed as a, a part of a sport um, hunting expedition. Um, and Cecil the lion was uh, a beloved lion um, and apparently was caught illegally. Um, <clears throat> but since then, the backlash from this um, this incident has caused a decrease in the amount of hunting expeditions uh, going in to kill lions. Um, and this has caused a population explosion of lions of sorts within the past couple years. Um, and so now the lions are overpopulated and they're, you know, usually the hunters would go in and control these populations. So they would usually only take a few, a certain amount. Um, and the money used for these hunting expeditions would also help to fund different things within the park. Um, so now that there's some population dynamics occurring which are causing problems from backlash from this incident. <clears throat> so, uh, a population uh, has a limit on its distribution, and those limits are based on the ability of the organism's um, homeostatic balance, right? So, homeostasis, the ability for an organism to survive and reproduce, to function, occurs over a range of conditions which vary geographically, and they can be very large. Um, the gray whale, for example, migrates from the southern tip of Baja all the way up to the Arctic range of Alaska and Siberia. In addition to that, um, monarch butterflies, a very small, you know, kind of lightweight insect, can also migrate thousands of miles from northern latitudes in the United States down to Mexico. Um, but they can't go worldwide, right? No animal can, it has such a great homeostatic um, range that they can go throughout all the um, environments of the world. And that's because of the physical limits of each environment. So the uh, niche is a concept which we have applied, we apply ecologically to represent um, what a species is able to do, where it lives and the resources it um, consumes. So basically, uh, the environmental factors that influence growth, survival, and reproduction of a species. And these can include um, both biotic and abiotic factors. So of course there's abiotic factors like temperature and climate and um, the actual physical, con physical conditions of an area, but also you have competition. Okay, so uh, we referenced this um, this study in the beginning of class where you have different warbler species which live in different parts of the tree based on the different types of insects that lived in these different parts of trees. So you have um, competition and uh, specializations of these individual species which allow them to specialize and so their niches are different where they consume resources um, depends on those different physical and uh, physical limitations and the competition between them similarly a coyote and a wolf they have different social dynamics 
um, biological social dynamics, um, and physically there are differences between them. So where a wolf can take much larger prey than a coyote. So Hutchison defined a niche as an n-dimensional hypervolume, which is kind of abstract, but n equates the number of environmental factors important to survival and reproduction of a species. The hypervolume then refers to the, if you were just looking at the physical limitations, um, a species could probably inhabit more than it actual, actually does. And so this is also called the fundamental niche. Um, now what a species actually is able to inhabit is the realized niche based on interactions with other animals such as competition. So the classic example of this is um, different barnacle species have different realized and fun, uh, fundamental niches. So this thalma species can inhabit further down in the intertidal zone because <clears throat> because of its um, homeostatic balance between that environment. And this other species is able actually to, um, would, if this thalma species wasn't there, go all the way up to that area as well. But because the thalma, the thamala species um, is there, it outcompetes it at this higher tides and thus reduces its realized niche. Okay, so oh, there we go. All right, so this is basically explaining the same thing, but organisms living in an intertidal zone, this is where the tide goes up and down and is exposed at some periods of time and then covered at other periods of time, depending on the tide. Connell found that uh, the th Thamelus species was restricted to the upper levels while the Balana species was middle and lower levels. But when they removed Thamelus, it was able to colonize the upper levels. So Balanus had a larger realized niche, but its fundamental niche was much smaller because of the um, competition of the Thamelus species. Okay, similarly, uh, this is an example of how climate affects uh, or abiotic factors affect the niche of species. So encelia species are distributed in different parts of the Southern California, Northern Mexico, Baja area based on temperature, climate, and other things. So E. Californica is confined to this narrow strip in Baja where it's cool and moist, getting moisture off the ocean. And these inland species um, have a higher tolerance for warmer areas and drier areas. And you can see there is a bit of overlap between them, but there's still other areas with, where they are unique. So um, a species distribution can be, have, take on three different forms. It could be random, where it's an equal chance of being anywhere. And this usually happens where the the resources are evenly distributed or uniformly distributed. Um, you can have a regular or uniform space and this happens uh, where specific areas are used exclusively and individuals avoid one another. Or you can have clumped where it's an unequal chance of being anywhere and this is usually happens when you have a mutual attraction between individuals and a patchy resource. Okay, so here you have random, um, where you have even distribution. It doesn't matter where you land, that's where you're going to start consuming resources. Regular spaced, you have some uh, competitive, usually competitive um, interaction, which causes um, you to only be able to use the resources in your immediate radius and anything outside of that would increase the competition between another um, another individual. Clumped is where the resources are probably patchy so you go to where those resources are more abundant um, and other species will go there as well. So some examples of this uh, Hubble and Johnson 
looked at two different types of, of bees, a bunch of different species, but two different types based on aggressiveness. They found the ones that were more aggressive were more evenly dispersed, so that aggressiveness kept them um, from getting close into each other's territories. Whereas a non-aggressive um, species was more randomly distributed. Okay, and these sites were marked with pheromones, which were to keep other um, organisms, other individuals away from their good nest sites. There are some patterns on large scales as well. So bird populations across North America have been found not be um, even evenly distributed. So root found at a continental scale by looking at bird surveys that pretty much all the birds were clumped in certain areas and not found anywhere else. Okay, the Christmas bird count happens every year where a bunch of amateur birders go out and they go to these different areas and then they just count birds. And then they record that data and it's been going on for um, years and years and years. And so they took this data and they looked at these different transects and they found that um, that individuals were found in low numbers in a, a lot of routes and then in high numbers in very few routes. And that was that was also among other species as well. So um, population density usually decri declines as an organism's size increases. So looking at multiple species, um, Damoth found that the population density of herbivorous animals decreased with an increased body size. It just makes sense. The bigger you are, the more resources you consume, consume the less um, the less uh, ability of the landscape to provide the nutrients you need. Um, and Peters and Wasberg also found the same thing with aquatic invertebrates and mammals and birds also follow that same pattern. When you put them all together, this is what it looks like. The larger the body mass, the, um, the decrease in density. So we have a negative relationship here. Uh, mammals, which are brown here, did tend to be larger than birds. Um, probably has to do with flight. Um, flight probably has a constriction, physical constriction on the size of birds. Um, in the middle here were vertebrate poikilotherms. Okay, so these are also um, restricted in their size because of their uh, thermoregulation patterns. And then you have in red invertebrates and blue invertebrates, aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates. But at all levels, you see this general trend towards a decrease in um, density as the animals increase. So another uh, important thing to look at is how rare a species is. And Rab Rabinowitz devised three factors which had, um, well, he, he looked at a bunch of different factors which would contribute to how rare a species of is. But um, three of them which had the most significance. One was geographic range of the species, second was habit tolerance, and three was local population size. Okay, and then he kind of uh, sub categorized these of having a large geographic range or small geographic range, and so on and so forth. So, populations that are least threatened by extinction have an extensive geographic range, range broad hab habitat tolerance, and some large local populations. Um, whereas, if you are on the other end of that, you are more likely to be extinct. Um, go into extinctions. So it has seven of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh no, these seven are the rare, are the combinations. This one on the top, these are the least likely to be um, extinct. But the three that were most vulnerable, that contributed most to rarity, 
were an extensive range, a broad habitat tolerance, and small local populations. Okay, so if you have an extensive range and a broad habitat, that's great. But if you are restricted to small local populations, that can cause um, problems if those small local populations are endangered in some way. So peregrine falcon, and that's what we have over here, fits that description. Rarity two, extensive range, large populations and a narrow habitat tolerance. So you can only live in a very small range of habitats. Well that, um, so this would be subject to things like global warming or hunting. So the passenger pigeon, um, these were very, very abundant, the most abundant bird in the United States um, when it was colonized, but they have a narrow habitat tolerance. So they were only found in very, very specific areas, which made them very easy to hunt. So we hunted them into extinction. All right, the third one would be a restricted range, narrow habitat tolerance, and small population. So this is the trifecta. These guys are, are not um, abundant and um, at risk of extinction. So an example of that is the California condor. They're very small populations. They can only live in a very narrow habitat range, and it's very restricted. All right, and that the California condor is uh, an endangered species. All right, that's it for populations.